Coming up next is Twitch, this week in computer hardware. And this week, Patrick and I talk about scratch-off CPU upgrades, upcoming NVIDIA GPU architectures, and a ton of your listener questions. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 88, recorded September 23rd, 2010. Scratch and sniff CPUs. Thanks for joining us on Twitch this week in computer hardware. I'm Ryan Shrout, joined by Patrick Norton. Hello, Patrick. Another sunny day in Northern California, it appears. Shockingly sunny, actually. And if I'm not mistaken, are you here in Northern California or are you tucked in the <sighs> back room of your home in Ohio? So I, I was supposed to, it was, I was trying to be a surprise here, but yes, uh, this lovely hotel room behind me is in downtown San Jose, uh, California. So I, I'm nearby. I'm nearby. Not couldn't make it up to the college today. Actually, I looked at renting a car to drive up there, and for whatever reason, Hertz wanted like $140 from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. That's the Bay Area, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somehow, somehow, going to take the car back to San Francisco Airport was like that. So, no matter, we are uh, online. We have Skype. We have bandwidth. We have com computers and such. So we don't have to be in person anymore. It's a wonderful technology. Uh, so we're going to talk about a couple of uh, interesting technology news bits and information. We've got a whole host of uh, questions that we will answer or attempt to answer or uh, pose to the audience and help and have them help us answer. Uh, first, just in case you weren't here last week, we do have a new email address, twitch at twit.tv, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. And that's the address now that you should be sending things to. Uh, they'll go that way. Both Patrick and I will get your email. We'll get a chance to peruse through uh, the multitude of emails we get each week, pick out a few that we think we might be able to answer or at least present interesting questions for the show. <laughs> Not fail miserably in the process of discussing. Hey, I've got no pro I got no no promises there, right? You know, it's sometimes you crash and burn, sometimes you fly high, and that's just that's how we go on this show. Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, let's get into just a, a, a few news bits. They'll be, they'll be fairly short and easy to get to. This first one I think was pretty interesting. I don't know if you had talked about it or had are seen you, this. Are you, else. are you angry about this or are you enthusiastic about this? Describe this is the first this Intel is. story, the Intel upgrade story. Well, tell, tell them what the, this is first, <laughs> and I'll tell you if I'm angry or not. Okay, okay. So Intel is now selling uh, upgrade cards in Best Buy stores, kind of like you would buy like the little, you know, Visa, you know, card or the gift, basically they look like the little rack of gift cards at, at the supermarket. And they will allow, uh, if you own a system with a Pentium G6951 processor, essentially it's a software unlock for additional performance. And I want to say, does it unlock two more cores in that processor? Yeah, what it does, okay, it goes yeah. from two to four-way multitask processing and increases the size of, of your cache. So you enable hyper-threading technology and you unlock the other half of the L3 cache that's already down on the board. Oh, there it yep. is. I know that my first thought was disgust and anger that Intel would simply be disabling technology in their CTU, CPU so they upcharge you at the register. Dun, dun, dun. Was that, actually, that, was, that, that is a direct Ryan Shrout text quote. Yes. You're disgusted yeah, yeah. and so angry. So not only do you get to listen to me, but you get to listen to somebody else read me too. So that's sorry, that's <laughs> probably bad uh, for our listeners. But you know, it's, it's just yeah. My first response was this was really kind of ignorant, um, taking advantage of dumb users, not dumb users, but less intelligent <laughs> users that aren't as competent in knowing what they're talking about in terms of computer technology. Let, and let's take them. intelligence out of this equation and let's say less informed or perhaps ah, less okay. investigative because you bias, you know, it's, I'm just saying, dude, you know, the, the intelligence, not knowing the fact that there's a peculiar processor that's been software, software dumbed down by Intel. I mean, you know, yeah, let's, that's fair. let's that's show fair. a little, let's show a little love here, Ryan. <laughs> Um, so what Patrick just said, uh, and then, then those users, 
would uh, be able to go to Best Buy and buy this little scratch off card. It's even, it even has like one of those scratch off pads at the back where you, you, you know, you reveal the little magic number and use that magic number to download your software from the Intel website and you voila, get these new features. Um, at first, I was kind of aggravated by it. I felt like they were taking advantage of people, people that weren't as well informed. Um, the more and more I thought about it, though, and more I talked about it with more people, I became less angry and actually kind of more impressed, uh, maybe even hopeful that they would bring this to other processors uh, that maybe more mainstream users would hmm. be able to take advantage of. And, and let me I'll try to explain why. So, I mean, most of us who are listening to the show know how to build your own computer, or at least you want to. You kind of right. know how that pricing structure works. Patrick, you'll know that, you know, sometimes the price difference between a processor that runs at 3.06 gigahertz and one that runs at 2.93 gigahertz can be $150 or 200 bucks. You know, and just yield almost there. no noticeable real-world performance difference. <laughs> Correct. And if you yeah. look at those CPUs, they're they're basically identical except for one switch one multiplier switch that allows it to run you know right. 200 megahertz faster or 133 megahertz faster depending on whatever your your native bus speeds are same thing when you look at the core i3 and the core i5 processor the core i5 and the core i3 cpus are technically identical in terms of the silicon that they have uh, they even run at the same frequencies the core i5 has hyper threading the core i3 does not so um, that's basically what is happening here is the uh, Pentium G6950 or 6951, whatever you want to call it. I think it has a special number just from uh, Gateway for this purpose. Is they're taking a non-hyperthreaded processor and they're enabling hyperthreading if you pay 50 more dollars. Um, and the reason all of a sudden I became kind of impressed and went, wow, this is kind of cool is maybe you're a consumer who built your own machine, who bought a Core i3. It's a dual core integrated mm -hmm. graphics. And now maybe it's like, okay, maybe maybe it's worth a little bit more to get that hyper-threading. Uh, and, and this allows you to do that after the fact. Uh, whereas for a regular consumer that didn't buy this very, very specific instance uh, of PC and a scratch-off card combination, you know, your, your, your SOL, you have to replace the whole chip. You have to buy a whole new chip if you want to do that. And so it made me think basically that all of these processor differentiations, cache sizes, frequencies, uh, hyper-threading, features, and some features like that, to some extent, not to all extent, are very much created by Intel and AMD, and even on the GPU side, really, to create differentiation and price markets and price differences that wouldn't be there otherwise. And all this is doing is kind of allowing, uh, if you have, what's that called, uh, post-purchase depression or post-purchase... Uh, <laughs> You know, you're, you're always nervous about what you bought. Uh, this kind of maybe gives people a little bit more flexibility there. I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, because bin sorting processors, right? I, I also wonder if at some point Intel started just having much more success in terms of per, the percentage, the yields, the sure. uh, percentage of successful CPUs off of a single die of silicon and was looking for a way to differentiate them better. I also wonder, you know, because, you know... It, a year, year and a half of new PC ownership, something like this could be really attractive for a lot of people, especially as more software takes better advantage of more cores over time. Man, mm -hmm. it's it's an I, I'm I'm really it's a fascinating experience. I, you know, it's 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 kind of makes sense that they partnered with Best Buy on this. You know, because there's a lot of stuff going on. You know, that uh, Dell has done with Best Buy, that Gateway has done with Best Buy, Intel's all their wide eye, the wireless display technology. It's something we're demonstrating on uh, on. Uh, uh, AC Nation, uh, the one that's coming mm -hmm. out on Monday, all of that was originally debuted through Best Buy. And it's really kind of like, oh, wow, they're they're sort of the last really serious nationwide electronic store. And, mm -hmm. you know, I I, 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 I I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, what the cost of this is going to be. Will it be available in the future? Is there going to be sort of a market for these notebooks in two years? Because, you know, it you is can, overpriced. Right. Yeah, I I'll think 100 bucks for what it is is too much. But, yeah. You know, so much of what you buy at Best Buy is overpriced, <laughs> at, at least True. compared to online. You know what I mean? It's, right. you know, it's, it's, it's the land of the $100. If you don't shop carefully, it's easy to drop $100 on a, a six-foot HDMI cable where you can get mm -hmm. the exact same functionality from a $6 cable. Okay, maybe the case isn't as nice. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it, it might have more bag you know, instead. Yeah, you know, if, if you sort of fatigue your HDMI cables by bending them and unbending them a lot, maybe the 
the $100 uh, cable might be worth it. But nice. yeah, I think it's I think it's a really interesting experiment on Intel's part. I'm really I'm, curious to see where it goes. Yeah, I'm curious to see if they if they try to expand this. I in in like I said, uh, I guess I'll just leave it this. If, if if you have opinions on this, if I want to hear what kind of the normal everyday user that buys their processors and has to make that decision, you know, I, I get tons <laughs> of CPUs in, so I, my the times I'm buying processors is pretty minimal, uh, and I'm lucky like that. But that obviously. Not many people get that advantage. So email us in, twitch at twit.tv. And I want to get some opinions on if this is something you you think, if you were like me, you thought it was really uh, arrogant up front. And then maybe you think um, I have swayed you on my opinion. And maybe uh, maybe you think that this is something they should expand out or if you think it's something they should get rid of completely. So that uh, was that was probably the most interesting thing that happened over the week. The other, uh, I'm actually in San Jose for uh, an NVIDIA GTC, GPU Technology Conference. They do, this is their second dedicated GPU Technology Conference, the uh, same time last year. And the purpose here is not really to focus on gaming, not really to focus on consumers at all. So uh, there's a little bit less to discuss for our audience here than you might originally think. <laughs> what they're really detailing is high performance computing, uh, using GPUs for uh, medical research and financial research and academia and, uh, you know, fluid simulations and uh, anything that you used to think of being called GPGPU, right? That That's what they're really bringing forth here. And... It's a totally different type of event than anything else. I think I said that last week when I was at IDF, where it was totally different than everything else because they present so much technical information about their architectures. They don't really do that. They didn't do anything like that here this week. Uh, what they did do was they brought in, you know, it's one of those things, if NVIDIA tried to tell us how awesome their parts were for medical research and improving <laughs> the lives of people, you just kind of go, yeah, 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 yeah. But what they did this time was they brought... Tons of people in to demonstrate that fact. They brought in uh, heart surgeons and brain surgeons and people that were doing cancer research. And then they brought people that were doing graphics research and movie development and 3D graphics and all kinds of different fields from everything uh, you could think of. And they had really cool movies and examples and speakers talking about things that were way over my head in terms of knowledge. Uh, there was a session where they were talking about uh, using GPUs to calculate growth rates of black holes. Um, and after the discussion, there was a Q&A and there were people actually debating the algorithms that were used to calculate the growth rates to begin with. And I'm like, okay, I'm, <laughs> the, wrong, I'm the wrong here. Uh, but it still pre presented really, really good information. Um, well, it's, 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 it's interesting. It's, no, I mean, it's definitely interesting. I, I was curious, the the main picture you have in the article up on PC Per, and, and one of the first quotes you have in there is basically discussing that they have, they're, they're not talking about the overall power of the GPU architecture as it moves forward over time so much as they are the reduction or the, the reduction in wattage per, per gigaflop or the increase of gigaflops per watt. Right. And I'm talking about like getting like, you know, what is it? Um, they're going to have like two billion invested in the Kelper design, which is going to be about four times as efficient as the Tesla design or the Fermi, Fermi design. I mean, it's and then there's like 2013. There's Maxwell up in the corner of this chart on the front <laughs> page, where they're talking about getting like, you know, literally almost three x, four x performance advantage over Kepler in terms of gigaflops per watt. I mean, is this is this basically Nvidia saying the power consumption of GPUs is just completely unhinged and it has to be scaled back, or are they just working within the limitations of the power supplies available in desktop PCs at well, this point? I it's, it's a little bit of both because um, it was a question they didn't want to answer, right? So as gamers and enthusiasts, I'm not really necessarily interested in performance per watt. Uh, to a certain degree, I am because I know the thermal limits of a desktop should be in the 250 watt per single card type thing, right? Um, but I was more interested in what's the raw performance of these new GPU architectures, Kepler and Maxwell. They really didn't go into any kind of performance detail. But uh, Jensen, who's the NVIDIA CEO, mentioned in, in his keynote that the, the whole performance per watt rating is the new performance. He said that several times. Mm -hmm. like people aren't really asking about performance, they're asking about performance per watt because you can always add more cards or more GPUs, but you might not be able to, um, 
or you'll be always be able to add more if you have th the thermal headroom. But if you have uh, a certain thermal limit, how much compute power can you get inside that? And can we bring the compute power of these GPUs down to a level where, you know, we can get the GTX? How quickly we're we going to get a GTX 480 into this Lenovo ThinkPad laptop? Um, so in that respect, it was kind of interesting. A little disappointing as an enthusiast. Interesting as uh, you know, like talking about theoretical computational dynamics and that kind of stuff. Um, but it was, it, you know, they're, they're they're again they're still talking to this kind of professional, high performance computing uh, people really with with this diagram and stuff because they even call it the CUDA GPU roadmap. <laughs> CUDA CUDA being their high performance computing language, you know, uh, proprietary computing language for NVIDIA uh, graphics processors. Um, Does that mean NVIDIA is giving up on 3D gaming as being the primary consumer of their products going forward? I mean, something we were talking about a lot is, of people. Is, go ahead. I was going to say, as as DirectX change, as the, uh, you know, as kind of the architecture changes, it seems like CUDA becomes less important for PC acceleration and maybe more important in, in third-party fields. Because cause you're kind of into the whole Sunday Magazine supplement, like, you know, they had doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs telling people right. exactly how they were making the world a better place. And I'm not saying that's that's not cool. Is there enough there to sustain NVIDIA in terms of the company that it is concentrating in those markets? Or or was this just such a, hey, we do stuff other than 3D gaming kind of show? I, I think it will go through a dramatic change. The discrete mm -hmm. graphics market is shrinking. It has been shrinking for a while. It will shrink to a certain point and then probably become... Um, pretty stable where it is. You, you think Intel is, is integrating uh, graphics onto the CPU, AMD is integrating graphics onto the CPU, Intel or NVIDIA does not have an x86 type of consumer standard desktop uh, CPU, so they don't, not really going to be able to take that uh, method forward. But the, the high performance computing, the professional First of all, I guess I should say NVIDIA probably makes most of their profit today on the Quadro mm -hmm. line of graphics cards. So that's the professional line uh, used by CAD developers and, and, and that type of thing, and 3D renderers and designers. Um, the GeForce makes some money, but it, it's, you know, they're, they're really kind of develop GPUs for both markets. And actually with the Fermi right. architecture, they really started designing it for that professional market. And I think we're, we're seeing is, you know, these high performance computing environments, medical sciences and research mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff are incredibly high margin for them. Um, and it's a place where they can single themselves out, stand out from a crowd. Uh, and then they put a lot of time and money and development into CUDA. And they've created this whole... GPU computing environment that has really made some drastic improvements or will make some drastic improvements in a lot of different fields. And they've basically done it on their own, right? Because AMD doesn't support CUDA. They didn't develop anything like that. There are open standards like OpenCL and, and uh, things like that, but are, those are years behind where CUDA's the state of CUDA's applications and tools are today. Uh, Intel's Larabee architecture obviously was canceled. Um, so there's, they've done a lot. I think they are... I think NVIDIA is putting a stake in the ground with two products, the, the, the high-end GPU market and then Tegra, you know, the little tiny chips that we're going to go in cell phones and tablets and that kind of stuff hopefully next year. So that is kind of, uh, I guess that's a state of NVIDIA as it is now. The, not great <laughs> news for GeForce users, not great news for NVIDIA gaming fans. They're not going away um, because if they're spending all this money developing high-end, high-performance computing GPUs anyway, there's no reason to not repurpose those into discrete cards until the market is completely dead. Uh, so if right. anything, NVIDIA will be the last stalwart of that in 2020 <laughs> whenever we're all completely you know, wiped away anyway from everything. So. At that point, we'll have little jacks in the back of our necks to get the yeah. latest. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just waiting It'll for that. Matrix. I like that thought. We got an email from Jeff about Core i7 upgrade prices. Hey, guys, I'm getting serious about upgrading to the i7. I remember when the i7 940 came out. It was quite a hit in the market. It sold for only a few dollars more than the 930. Looking around, I see you can buy an i7 950 for less money than the 940. What's up? Is the 940 that much more impressive than the other? 
Oh boy. <laughs> CPU pricing based on timing and scarcity in the market, you'll often actually find a newer, more powerful CPU available for less money than an older CPU, uh, especially mm -hmm. in smaller shops because maybe they purchased the inventory on the smaller C or the older CPU when that CPU hadn't been dropped down in price by the introduction of newer high-end CPUs. Um, but no, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's 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 just it's it's kind of the you know the it's really funny if you if you go to somebody like Dell, uh, it's really amazing as as you sort of drive down the avenue towards the big Dell factory, you'll see things like you know Intel will have a building and hard drive manufacturer one and hard drive manufacturer two and GPU manufacturer one and 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 memory company, you know four well you know all these different companies you think like oh these all these these are all the people who supply parts for Dell isn't it nice for them to have like customer service reps nearby and it's like no. The way they do inventory control for, for massive PC makers because they're working on such tight margins for the building of their units is that literally like all of these PC parts vendors have great big van, or at least the last time I got to, to go to her Dell, there's like a big old set of truck loading gates at one end of the Dell factory, you know, and the hard drive company backs up and the mother drive company backs up. Well, motherboards are, are mostly co-branded, <laughs> but you know what I mean, like the, the chip, you know, the Intel truck pulls up and the hard drive truck pulls up and the GPU truck pulls up. And as they build individual um, PCs, basically all the parts get binned at once and Dell pays for them when they cross the back of the van into their building. <laughs> They, they, they don't pay for them to sit in a warehouse and, and they do that to manage their inventory. And the reason they do that is they don't want to have a whole bunch of, you know, I-940 parts that are worth 60 bucks on the books to them when I-950s are selling for $50. So, right. you know, it's, uh, it, it's just the way of the world, Jeff. Uh, it's a little random. The 940 is probably not that much better. In fact, I would say since it's 10 lower, it's probably a less <laughs> part. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I would go for the less expensive part and play around with overclocking to your heart's content. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Second question. Should we, should we do Jeff's second question or should we move on to the next one in the queue? No, it, it's, um, it's, it's pretty quick. He said it just says he has two GeForce uh, 8800 GTS graphics cards running an SLI and a Core 2 Duo 3 gigahertz board. And he's asking if he's seen improve, uh, performance improvement with just a single GTX 460. And I think the answer is going to be no there. A pair of 8800s, uh, 8800 GTS cards and SLIs, probably pretty close. Mm -hmm. But I have no idea for knowing for exactly exactly sure uh, because that's that's an older configuration i haven't tested in a while but you do, you do get <laughs> other features with the 460 as well dx11 and some other stuff like that but uh, um, let's see I we love have an email question <laughs> yeah this this is a good one I and mean, this is some of, the, some of the stuff that i guess probably we take for granted for knowing that um Probably actually, I don't, don't, I don't know the answer to this one. I was going to, I like, oh. I, 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 I'm laughing because I actually am in a situation where, well, when it was, Seth wants to know if he can drop a PCI Express X1 card and a PCI Express X16 slot, which normally, you know, we associate one with audio cards or, or USB mm -hmm. 3.0 cards. And the X16 slot, we usually think I'm going to drop a GPU in that. Are there any compatibility issues? He's looking to put a Hompog tuner card in my home theater PC, and they are all PCI Express 1 cards, and I want to make sure it will work before I buy it. Always a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the answer is you can absolutely do that. Uh, drop a, a buy one into a buy 16. You can drop a buy four or a buy eight into a buy 16, and it will have no problems working. It will get its maximum amount of bandwidth. The only, and I don't, there's no compatibility issues. The only thing that will happen and I think it will happen. I don't know what motherboard he has exactly. Is if you have a, 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 a like a P55 board that has two by 16 physical slots, mm -hmm. you only have 16 lanes of bandwidth going between the two of them. If you only have one one card installed, the primary card will get all 16 lanes of bandwidth. If you install mm -hmm. anything in the second card, it swaps it so that the primary will get eight and the secondary will get eight. Now, oh, wow. that sounds bad because you're cutting your bandwidth in half, but it's not a big deal. Uh, even the, the top-end graphics cards today aren't moving enough data around on the system to saturate a by eight bus so uh it's still it's still not an issue and you'll be able to run your your hot pod tuner cards without any problem on there so good to know 
He also, Seth also wants. He, oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. I was gonna say he pointed out that the we asked about internet browsers for home theater PCs. He's found one based on Firefox, but it allows you to apparently set a permanent Zoom setting so web pages are easier to read. It's called Kylo.tv. K Y L O.tv. Yeah. Have you ever used that? I, I've seen it in action. I have not installed it myself, but okay. uh, it's one I'm going to play around with. I, I'm sort of in between home theater PCs right now because uh, um, there's so many set-top boxes in my life right now and two more set-top boxes on order. I'm kind of, I've, I've put the home theater PC away for the time being. <laughs> Underst yeah, understandable. <laughs> Um, yeah, things have been on, on AC Nation. Like we've looked at the new, the Roku XDS, and I just got the pop box in a couple of weeks ago. And the Apple TV is coming, and the boxy box is coming, and there's a WD TV a live. Yeah, it's it goes with the territory, dude. I don't have 72 <laughs> monitors in my living room, but I have eight set top boxes all heating up my house. Kept the heating bills really low at my old house though, which was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony's looking for the spousal permission for an upgrade. He says my wife is letting me upgrade my computer this Christmas. Congratulations, dude. If I follow the budget build on the PC Perspective site, would it be worth spending 150 bucks to upgrade to 4 gigabytes of RAM and the processor to an AMD Phenom 2 X61055T with that bottleneck the video card, the 5670? Um, I'm always up for maxing out the amount of RAM you can fit on the motherboard, but I also tend to operate with like 3,200 browser windows, three applications, and usually something, you know, churning code in the background. So uh, I think the four gigabytes of RAM is especially good um, under Windows mm -hmm. 7 because of the way it's handling the caching of applications and the accessing of applications. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go a big thumbs up on the four gigabytes of RAM. How about the Phenom 2? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the Phenom 2, so the, the base processor in there is a $99 Athlon 2 X4, so it's a four-core processor. And then the CPU he wants to upgrade to is actually a six-core processor. Um, I, 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 if, if it's within that budget, I would definitely, you know, say move, move on up from the four-core to the six-core. Would that be a bottleneck to the graphics card? The 5670 is, I don't think it will be the, I don't think you're going to create a, like a significantly noticeable bottleneck with a quad core mm -hmm. processor on a on a Radeon 5670 card. Um, although now that I think about it, I might spend that budget, whatever the difference is between the Athlon 2 X4 and the Phenom X6, Phenom 2 X6 processor. Mm -hmm. And I might be more tempted to move that into a graphics card, maybe move up to a 5750 or a 5770, depending on where they're priced at now. I think you can get a 5770 for about $140, maybe $150. So, and the, the one we have in our budget system here is a $80 card. So it sounds like it will work out uh, pretty well from there. I'm, if you're going to do gaming, I tend to say lean towards spending a little bit more on the graphics than the CPU at this point. I mean, the, the quad-core mm -hmm. Athlon processor is going to be pretty good, so <laughs> no complaints there. Uh, let's see, we've got an email from Michael about a, a high-end PC for high-end video production, I guess. He says he works at a church doing teleproduction stuff, everything video-related from production to streaming to post and publishing. Because the facility was designed with professionals in mind, it's all SDI. He's currently stuck having to pipe the video through a converter into a prosumer DVD recorder and then rip that video, <laughs> demangle the aspect ratio, and deinterlace it before I can edit it Edit it to go online. Um, he says he purchased an SDI capture card from Blackmagic to tidy up my workflow. However, there wasn't enough computer in the intended computer to handle things. I assume he meant performance in the intended computer to yeah. handle things. Uh, what hardware would we recommend to support capturing live video and hopefully being able to run Ustream, Producer, Flash Media Encoder, and some other stuff at the same time? Uh, so, yeah, that's... So if he's working with SDI, that's a lot of data. Um, yeah. So for anybody who's not familiar with SDI, is Serial Digital Interface, it's the it's the kind of super professional spec for bringing relatively raw video from a camera into a switching board and then switching your video, mixing everything down. Um, 
You know, my rule of thumb with video production, especially for doing rendering of, of video for online distribution or anywhere else, is to buy as much computer as you can afford. Uh, mm -hmm. Core i7, you know, six gigabytes of RAM, maybe 12, depending on how many mm -hmm. things you plan on running simultaneously. Um, I would probably, if, if, if the church has the money, I would pro throw my operating system and my primary editing application on an SSD drive and have a, probably a Western Digital Black or, or one of the faster or Seagate drives, um, uh, if not several of them for video capturing and editing. Um, yeah. Blackmagic used to ship an app. I thought they still shipped an application for capturing video. Also, most video editing applications have the ability to capture video. I would be curious if Ustream Producer is going to be compatible with the Blackmagic card. I think it will be because of the way the, the video architecture is handled inside of Windows. Um, they make nice hardware. Um, you know, I would also, hopefully you only have to capture a single SDI stream because the more cards you start <laughs> to drop on the system, the more complicated things get. You know, I'll be honest with you, uh, Michael, uh, you know, figure out what your budget is and buy the most processor and memory and hard drives you can fit in that. And then as a secondary consideration, look at your primary tasks inside of your video editing software and see whether or not there's any GPU acceleration going on there. And if there's not, then go with the cheapest graphics you can get away with. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a uh, that's uh, the video editing and and especially encoding. Um, go for the biggest, baddest processor you can afford and the and the most RAM you can afford. Because the other thing is, video editing Absolutely. stations do not age gracefully over time. Uh, if it's an avid station, you know what I mean. They kind of you know set things to a certain standard and you live with it because you spend a gigantic pile of money on an avid system. But man, for prosumer types, prosumer type stuff like this uh, you know in two years you're going to be wanting to create bigger files or more formats or distribute them differently and and having as much as much processors as you can for as long as you can is kind of critical for that so well said absolutely more Thank cpu you. more memory <laughs> get that deal done uh we got an, uh, a long email here from uh, Stu that I kind of read over and sum I'll summarize a little bit for the two of us here. Um, he basically is talking about uh, he's purchasing, he has purchased a pair of EVGA GTX 460s and uh, has a set of three 23 inch monitors. Obviously he's planning on doing an NVIDIA surround gaming setup. He's having some problems with software in terms of driver and configuration. He says he has things uh, after he goes through the setup in the NVIDIA control panel, uh, he goes and he adjusts just for bezel correction of each monitor. He says it looks terrible, really stretched out looking. Maybe he's doing something wrong with the resolution. Now I'm assuming he's talking about in a 2D mode here uh, that he's talking about. If it's in 2D, then you have a driver, a specific driver issue with the resolution that these three monitors came out. Are they the exact same monitor? Are they all um, enabled? Have you, if you do it in clone mode, if you just choose clone mode, do all three displays work correctly then? Um, I check that. The other, I guess the other easy thing to say is uninstall the driver, download the new NVIDIA uh, 260 dot whatever drivers that came out just, I think, two weeks ago, maybe less than that. Actually, they're really new, so he, you may not have them yet, uh, Stu. They, the, these are much easier in terms of installation and, and uninstallation. The installation mm -hmm. process actually does like a, a driver sweeper type cleaning out of your registry and all kinds of other junky settings that might be screwing things up. Cleans all that up, installs the new driver, and then the tutorials, not the tutorials, but the walkthroughs and the kind of guides on how to set up your NVIDIA surround configuration are actually uh, streamlined and are easier to use in this new version of the driver as well. So I definitely tried that. Now, if he's talking about stretching in games, that's going to depend on the game, right? The game needs to be able to support... The games, most games will be able to support these resolutions. It's whether or not they're able to support those aspect ratios. So there are mm -hmm. some games that we've noticed where it does kind of take an image and stretch it too far. You're always going to get a little bit of a uh, fisheye effect on the left and right monitors on the, on the far edges of those just because of the way game engines are built today. Uh, we've had, we got another email further down the list that, uh, that, that or further down the, the, the stream that I saw that kind of has the same type of thing. It says, hey, I didn't really like the way the, the stretching looked on the side, and that's something that a lot of people have expressed opinions about. I, I actually play the games, and I don't like, I don't mind it because 
those are in my periphery anyway. And that's kind of how the eyes up, uh, up, up here to work anyway. So, um, Without, I guess you can't really, I can't really say for sure if you're talking about 2D or 3D mode there, but uh, 2D mode, 3D mode, actually both. I would just always make sure you've got the latest driver. Uh, go to NVIDIA.com, check out the GPU, or uh, check out the latest 260 driver for the GeForce GPUs, give it a shot, and then you can go back and try Civ 5, StarCraft 2, uh, those types of things, uh, which are apparently his favorite games. Have you, uh, Civ 5, I haven't started yet. This is a, as an aside <laughs> because I don't, I have other things that apparently work has to be done and grass has to be mowed and things like that, which is a little disappointing. That whole um, sleep thing. <laughs> Just get your yeah, sleep mode, dude. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So there he goes too. I mean, it's not it's not a definite answer for you, but it's it, it, check with the drivers first, and if and if it's check with other different games as well. Civ Five and StarCraft Two might be two of the worst games for uh, NVIDIA Surround or AMD Affinity Solutions because I know that the uh, I know for a fact StarCraft Two doesn't support it, and I'm not sure if Civ Five supports it. I see. I feel like Nvidia would have been telling me, or AMD would have been telling me, if there were really good games for uh, surround gaming, and they haven't done that. Real time strategy games in general, they just try to prevent uh, cheating, what they consider to be cheating, where you can see more of the screen at one time, one time than anybody else in the multiplayer matches. So that might be part of it as well. Try a couple of first person shooters, try something else, and and, and see what that's like. Sounds like a plan. Yep. So, whoops, pardon me as I drag the script window around. Uh, William has a question about USB 3.0 external drives. He wants to get a hard drive enclosure for use with regular SATA drives. He wants it to be as future-proof as possible. Don't we all, William? Indeed. So I want it to be able to handle the largest hard drive capacity possible, even sizes that aren't commercially available yet, such as 3 terabytes and beyond. And I want it to be able to use both USB 2.0 and 3.0. The last part's easy. The capacity yeah. thing's kind of interesting. Um, William says, the biggest problem I'm having is searching for hard drive enclosures by maximum capacity. Uh, many mm -hmm. hard drive enclosures either don't say what the max capacity is or the largest hard drive they can handle, or such a spec is buried in the fine print. Do you have recos for buying hard drive enclosures? Is there any way I can sort hard drive enclosures by maximum capacity? Is the maximum capacity of a hard drive enclosure something you'd recognize by some type of controller? And what happens if I put in a bigger drive than the enclosure is rated for? Finally, is now a bad time to buy such a device because USB 3.0 is so new? I uh, hope not. I actually just bought a USB 3.0 dock <laughs> <laughs> like two weeks ago. Um, nice. It was also so cheap at 20 bucks. I'm not really going to care if I have to replace it in two years uh, so I can fit my eight terabyte drives in it. But hmm, what are you thinking on that one? I'm going to actually see if I can find the spec for the dock I bought. <laughs> sure. Uh, he's right in that it is. I've never seen uh, that kind of specification listed on like Newegg or Amazon that uh, is easily searchable or easily sorted by. And it's one of those things that we've never had to deal with until we got past this kind of two terabyte rating. I would be surprised if there were any hard drive docks out there on the market today that didn't support two terabyte hard drives. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly it comes down to how the operating system is handling it. He talks about three terabyte drives specifically. Um, and I, I can't say for sure, though, if, if that would, I haven't, I haven't tested with any of the three terabyte drives, which makes me hesitant to answer for sure, yes or no, either way. Um, I know in the past, different controllers were affected, but that, I, I feel like that was something that we have moved past now, uh, that we've gone away <laughs> from really seeing those, those controller differences make that, big, make that much of a difference. Uh, I'm not uh -huh. sure if he's using older bays or not? I mean, did you find the spec on yours and specifically? Well, the first two USB 3.0 drive, I, and I'm looking at docks, not enclosures, because um, I've kind of evolved to using docks instead of enclosures whenever possible. Um, sure. But they're looking at, they're certified for four terabytes, or they're claiming support for four terabytes. Um, mm. So that's a start. Yeah, I think you're going to have to get your sleuth on. Yeah, you go might ahead. have to. It might be something where you go to Newegg or Amazon, and you have to go to that uh, manufacturer's website and start looking through their detailed specifications for it. Then uh, it's, I mean, four terabytes is we're. Gonna, I mean, that'll last you a while. We're talking about single drive enclosures, right? Or is it a right. dual drive enclosure? It's a. It's a. It's a we're talking about single or drive dock. capacity. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's and that's yeah, I think I think that would be more than enough to get you through a couple of years. I don't know if we'll see four terabyte drives in uh, in the next twelve months or not. We're just now seeing the very first three terabyte drive, and honestly, these other hard drive companies aren't real eager to um, like follow suit with what Seagate did. So, <laughs> it's, yeah, the, the the Seagate release of the three terabyte drive and an external drive before they do the. Uh, that just fascinates me how they basically released it as an enclosed drive rather than as a upgradable drive. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's boy, it's going to take some digging to find out the information on this. I wouldn't be surprised if most of them are supposed to be good for four terabytes. I, of course, will be eating those words by the next episode of the podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> Always. But I, I, I will, yeah, and you know, the largest drive I can get a hold of right now is two terabytes. Speaking of which, by the way, uh, two terabyte hard drives are down to like 100 to 120 or 100 to 110 bucks on sale around here, whether they're, uh, nice. depending on what brand you're looking at. And one terabyte drives are, are closing in on 75 bucks on sale. So if you're thinking wow. about upgrading uh, to hard drives it's, or upgrading your hard drive to something much larger, it's not a bad time to do it. Just wanted to lay that one out there. <laughs> now, I, I, I'll, I'll mention this to you, although it's only going to make you jealous and angry that you didn't listen to uh, the, the PC Perspective podcast we did yesterday. Crucial mm -hmm. was selling <laughs> refurbished uh, SSDs. Decent Indie Links based controller SSDs, 250 for a dollar a gig, essentially. 256 gig SSD for $256. Um, and that's like less than a third of the price per gigabyte of other well priced, well performing SSDs. Now, I just checked, I'm not going to bother pointing anything out because the link is already dead. They're already sold out of all those. <laughs> and 64 is for $64 and 128 is for $128 as well. I ordered a couple of them just because that's so cheap for what they were. Uh, it's something to keep an eye on. It was actually at uh, the crucial.com uh, refurbished memory site uh, and they were selling them there. So I, we sold them out while we were recording the show live, of course, which <laughs> ten, tends to happen, tends to happen on this network. So that's pretty cool. Wow. So the Vantech four terabytes, and it looks like the less expensive controllers uh, are supporting, claiming two terabyte support, although that could change over time. Right. Man, cool. oh man. And I got to go verify that mine's a Windstar. I, I, I'll only be able to support the only drive I can buy at the maximum capacity for the next few months. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll be, I think we'll I think we'll all make it with that. Um, so I guess that's going to round out our show for this week. Again, just to reiterate here: the email, new email address is twitch at twit TV. Email in your questions for Patrick and I, and we will uh, maybe get to them on next week's episode. Also, of course, you need to follow both uh, Patrick and I on Twitter. We do kind of quiz people for questions there as well. I am at Ryan Shrout. Patrick is creatively named as well, at Patrick Norton. <laughs> we make it easy. We make it as easy, although we could make it as simple as at Patrick and at Ryan. We weren't that quick, apparently. Yeah, I think actually Patrick was one of the original founders or friends of founders oh. for Twitter. So yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty short list on that one. <laughs> uh, PCPer.com, is that still the location or have you changed the is, URL? No, oh, I hope not. That's still that's what I'm giving out to everybody. So I hope that's the same. Yep, that's where you'll find all of the reviews that I write, news that we write, uh, covering PC hardware, notebooks, SSDs, all those goodies there. So if you want more information on specific hardware items, check that out. And uh, other, let's see, we've got techzilla.com for Patrick, and hdnation.com. Is that a correct URL? HDNation.tv, so home HD theater and high depth at HDNation.tv and Techzilla uh, is at T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A dot com, and that's where we get our geek on. So if you're curious actually about the uh, about the new uh, Roku boxes with the USB side loading, the uh, WD or the XDS, uh, definitely check out Techzilla this week or HD Nation next week. It's interesting to look at what they're doing, and all I got to say is 1080p out Apple 
please get it together. To find out what else those boxes can do, check out techzilla.com. So, Very cool. We will do so. A little tease there. <laughs> and if you want to watch us record this show live, you can do that. We record every Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern at live.twit.tv. And, of course, the URL for the site is twit.tv slash twitch, T-W-I-C-H. So with that, we will uh, close out this week's show, and we will see you next week. 